I'm uh, Maxim Pares. Uh, I'm one of the uh, trainer of Gender Equality Academy and one of your two trainers for uh, this morning session. Um, I'm also a gender scholar uh, specialized on uh, gender equality policies in a comparative perspective, also in Central Eastern Europe, uh, which is a, a mild focus of this uh, of this training session. Um, I'm, I'm happy to, to pass the floor to, uh, to Giovanna, uh, my co-trainer for, for today. Uh, we will uh, take you through, uh, through the introduction to this session. Giovanna, please. Yes, thank you, Maxim. Uh, I'm Jovana Mihailovic Terbot. So I come from um, a research uh, center of the Slovenian Academy of Sciences and Arts, where I'm a research fellow working on politics and cultural studies. And uh, I'm working on issues of gender equality in academia, especially female scientists in socialism and post-socialist setting. Uh, and I also participated in gender equality plan uh, development and implementation at my organization. So it's also, uh, I'm, I will be talking today uh, also from personal experience. Before uh, we move on to the topic of uh, today's uh, workshop, I, will, I would like to introduce you to Gender Equality Academy program, which was uh, developed to provide a coherent capacity building uh, uh, by uh, trainers uh, with their own experience. Um, uh, and uh, it is based on state-of-the-art uh, knowledge and uh, expertise from the trainers who are also gender Gender experts themselves. Um, the specificity of Gender Equality Academy is that it's providing tailor, also tailor-made uh, trainings uh, to different target groups, uh, to decision makers in uh, research and academia, uh, human resources management or uh, gender or equality diversity officers or people uh, providing these services in, in institutions, and of course, researchers and scientists uh, down themselves. Um, Gender Ac Academy is providing different formats uh, of the training. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, we are not providing in-person uh, trainings uh, due to the COVID, but before the pandemic started, um, we did, and this is the plan also after. Uh, in, uh, in the meantime, we have improved uh, online trainings, which are also available in non-pandemic times. Uh, different workshops uh, for institutions or for um, a heterogeneous uh, group as it is uh, today from different countries, different institutions. Uh, we are also providing webinars. Uh, you can find videos of uh, previous webinars on G Gender Equality Academy website. And we are also providing summer schools uh, as uh, uh, more intensive, uh, in-depth uh, format, uh, and um, uh, uh, DOCC, which is an uh, interactive version of uh, uh, what is called uh, MOOC, uh, uh, Massive uh, Open Online Courses. So this, these are modification of that. Uh, it's called Distributed Open Collaborative Courses, meaning that they are more in accordance with uh, uh, feminist pedagogy, which is one of the basic principles of uh, Gender Equality Academy, because it's more um, democratic, uh, more um, uh, in involving experiences of the participants, therefore uh, it's more interactive. Uh, and uh, it's covering, uh, the, all these trainings are covering different topics um, that are um, uh, more, um, more basic or more advanced, depending on the previous experience of uh, train uh, of the participants. Uh, and uh, the topics are spanning um, uh, from organizational culture to issues of work-life balance, uh, evaluation in academic careers, uh, uh, and of course, uh, gender in curricular uh, and the uh, subject of research. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so our agenda for today uh, is to first present uh, some basic concepts uh, 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 that are important for understanding issues of gender equality. Uh, 
in academia then to move on uh, to status quo uh, uh, on um, uh, gender equality issues, uh, a little bit of data and statistics, which are basically showing uh, where are we at the moment in uh, research and academia. Uh, then further on, Maxim will introduce you to European policies uh, promoting gender equality in research. Uh, and then after the short break, we will have our work uh, in uh, the groups where first we will uh, work, uh, so work in subgroups. Uh, first, we will um, look how to get started with institutional change, and then we will have a uh, 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 an activity on how to conduct gender analysis. And we will close with uh, reflecting on what we have learned today, how, um, how it's going, how we will bring it back home. Okay, let's move to the key concepts um, uh, that are uh, uh, um, just to uh, get everybody on board with some basic concepts that are necessary for understanding uh, uh, gender equality issues. So usually when we are uh, uh, talking about, we are using uh, uh, words gender equality, but uh, it's um, uh, necessary to understand the difference between sex and gender. Um, uh, sex refers to biological characteristics that are making difference between men and women. Uh, uh, in the meaning, meaning different reproductive organs, uh, different uh, uh, chromosomal co complements, uh, uh, different uh, hormones and physiology. Um, and as such, uh, uh, sex is globally understood as um, a classification of living things, so not only uh, human, uh, into male or female. Uh, uh, in those living uh, uh, um, living things that do have uh, different sex, uh, and it is understood as something objective and fixed. However, we will see further on that uh, it's not uh, uh, this binarity is not even um, uh, uh, so fixed as it is uh, presented to us. That um, on the other hand, um, gender refers to some. Thing social. It's a social construction, uh, social understanding what um, woman or man means, or better to say what is femininity and a masculinity um, in the way that they are understood by uh, certain di different societies. Therefore, uh, the definition or notions of masculinity and femininity change over time and from society to society, uh, so from place to place and um, uh, from cultures to cultures. Um, therefore, uh, as a concept, gender is uh, more fluid than sex uh, and it changes uh, over time. Uh, however, uh, the persistence of uh, gender inequalities that we will discuss today is showing how that also gender, even if it's fluid, it, is, it takes time uh, for these notions to change in, in cultures. Uh, so um, they are in constant change, but they are also inert. Yes, please, Maxim, the next uh, slide. However, the, the concepts are, uh, uh, this, this, the picture is even more complicated when in, we introduce new con uh, additional concepts. So um, through this gender bred person, I think it's a good way to present these concepts. So um, as we see biological sex, as we said, are is objectively a measurable difference in organs, hormones, and chromosomes. Um, and uh, we have uh, male and um, uh, uh, female uh, sex. However, uh, uh, we like to uh, understand it uh, as a continuum. As you see, uh, the third uh, purple line uh, is showing that male and female are just extremes uh, of a, within a continuum and uh, statistically small, but, but still uh, present. Uh, there is a small number of individuals, uh, humans, uh, who are uh, intersex, uh, meaning that uh, they are bi biologically structured in a way that uh, you cannot easily say whether they are a man or a woman. Uh, for instance, people born with uh, both uh, genitalia or uh, where uh, chromosomes do not fit uh, their um, 
reproductive organs and so forth. Uh, and, in, and when we move to the issue of gender, uh, even more, we should understand that gender is not a binarity between men and women, but should be understood as a continuum where femininity and masculinity are just um, are just uh, the end extremes. Uh, so um, when we talk about gender, it is important to understand that there is a difference between gender identity, and that is how somebody feels or thinks about themselves, uh, and gender expression, and that is how they uh, show themselves to the world, how they dress, how they behave, in what way they speak. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, if we understand the gender identity as a continuum between extremes of where uh, at the ends are men and women, uh, there are many people who are somewhere in the gray area or in purple rainbow area, people who uh, feel uh, gender uh, queer or intergender. Uh, there is a whole discussion of uh, a plurality of notions and, and uh, um, concepts uh, that uh, describe how people feel about themselves outside of uh, boxes of men and women. And uh, the same is for gender expression, and that is how people uh, uh, express themselves to the society. So many people do not fit into clear boxes of typical femininity and masculinity, you know, uh, female wearing dresses and men we wearing ties. But there are many people who uh, decide uh, uh, to present themselves in more androgynous way or, uh, ways or outside these typical boxes. And then we have sexual orientation. And that is uh, something that is uh, describing who are we we attracted to. And this is not directly connected with the gender, but uh, it's more um, uh, connected to, uh, so who are we attracted to? But this is also socially conditioned because societies are allowing us or not allowing us to love, marry and express our love in publicly uh, uh, acceptable ways. Uh, this is also socially conditioned. So, um, when we talk about gender equality, Maxim, uh, please, the next uh, slide. Um, we understand uh, uh, gender equality as uh, freedom to develop the personal abilities and choices uh, without uh, uh, limitations imposed by strict gender roles as they are defined by traditional patriarchal society. So although gender uh, is often uh, 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 refers primarily to the uh, situations of men and women, uh, attention should be uh, given also to uh, preventing discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation, so to uh, people in LGBT uh, plus uh, community, uh, and gender identity and expression uh, uh, meaning uh, uh, expressing outside of these typical traditional uh, boxes of typical femininity and typical masculinity. So when we talk about gender equality, we are not just speaking about women, but uh, uh, in a more uh, broader understanding of uh, what equality is. And when we talk about equality, gender is just one of many ways uh, through which people can be discriminated. Uh, and uh, gender discrimination is never, uh, uh, di di is uh, only is never divorced from other types of uh, discrimination because our identity is complex. So Maxime, please, next slide. Um, uh, this is why we um, like to talk uh, 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 about intersectionality as a basic approach from which we are starting. Intersectionality is a way of understanding humans, that every person is a mosaic of identity, where gender is just one aspect of identity. Another is our education, our um, ethnic background, our race, 
age, uh, ability or disability, being uh, marital status, being married or single. These are all aspects that are basically defining our position within society uh, and may put us in different uh, roles and uh, uh, different experiences. I would also like to say that uh, um, each of us uh, will probably choose the strategy how to mobilize support for uh, these gender equality measures uh, in the institution. And maybe some of uh, what we are presenting is not uh, good for your argument, or uh, I mean, something uh, else like European policies might be the good persuasive argument. However, we are starting uh, with uh, this introduction for you because we wanted to uh, open like to start the debate from the same level of uh, understanding of the basic concepts. A big um, uh, uh, horizontal segregation. So even though uh, the number of women in science in research has increased over time, there is a big difference across uh, academic fields, which are creating sort of horizontal segregation uh, 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 among genders, uh, meaning that uh, uh, women uh, have entered certain academic fields and are even now dominating or being majority in certain academic fields in certain countries while in other uh, academic disciplines, they are still in minority. I'm here presenting she figure data. Try to look at uh, your country uh, the, or the color of your country and uh, look uh, what is the, this is the number of or percentage of women uh, um, researchers uh, in uh, uh, natural sciences, then engineering and technology, medical sciences, uh, social sciences, humanities. And as you can see in, um, hum in social sciences, humanities and medical sciences in majority of European countries, women are majority. While it is evident then in engineering and technology and uh, to a lesser extent in natural sciences, but also there, these two academic fields are still traditionally male uh, dominated. Maybe what you can notice is that uh, certain uh, countries uh, in Eastern and Central Europe have a much higher uh, uh, scores of uh, women in uh, uh, these academic fields than compared to Western European countries. Uh, and I think this is important to uh, note because um, this is these data are also undermining this understanding that somehow gender equality is more developed in the Western European countries. Data are some, sometimes showing that socialist uh, legacy or uh, legacy of uh, different uh, scientific developments uh, uh, are uh, producing different level of uh, gender equality. Uh, however, more, even more problematic this, uh, than this horizontal segregation is vertical segregation, which is clearly uh, gendered uh, in all academic fields. Maxim, please, next slide. Yes, maybe just uh, because it's uh -huh. a very technical question answering to, I think it's uh, Lina's question yeah. about which statistic database are used for as for uh, the chief figures, which is a compendium, the EU compendium about the gender situation in research and the academia is based on uh, Eurostat uh, statistics provided by uh, the member states. So this is the baseline we have. These are national uh, computed, nationally computed uh, data. Sorry to interrupt. Yes, thank you. So um, these are basically official data uh, uh, gathered by national statistical agencies of each country and then uh, uh, put together by um, European Institute for Gender Equality. And here we have an um, uh, example of um, we have data uh, that are showing vertical segregation, which is clearly gendered. So if you look at the right hand uh, graph uh, on your screen, you will see that uh, orange um, line is showing the number of women. And at the beginning, uh, so uh, the first uh, point uh, is showing um, 
number of undergraduate students that are entering universities. And the next uh, point is showing the number of uh, uh, students that are graduating. And then the next points are showing uh, a beginning and the end of uh, postgraduate studies. And then uh, grades uh, C, B, and A. A meaning the highest level of uh, academic um, ladder. And uh, as you can see, the, the uh, women are constituting majority of undergraduate students in all academic fields, uh, if we put together all universities, all academic fields together in whole of Europe. And uh, at the level of uh, postgraduate studies, it's becoming 50-50, depending from country to country. Here on the EU level, we can see that the women are uh, almost half. In Slovenia, for instance, uh, women are also majority uh, or just above um, 50 percent uh, uh, among uh, grad postgraduate students as well. However, this does not translate to the highest levels of academic hierarchy. And the higher we go, there are, there is bigger discrepancy between men and women, and men are occupying the highest uh, academic positions. On the left hand, you see the graph that is uh, showing that situation is even more dire in um, uh, engineering uh, and natural sciences. So it's um, the left graph is uh, showing uh, data on the European level, but just for this scientific disciplines. And as you can see, women are minority, both at undergraduate, uh, graduate, uh, and at the level of um, uh, teaching. However, uh, uh, even here, uh, there is a bigger number of women on uh, postgraduate courses uh, doing their doctoral studies. And this number, this percentage is not translated into the percentage of women teaching in uh, techniques and uh, engineering. So uh, these data confirm phenomenon that is of, often called a uh, leaky pipeline. So please, next slide. Leaky pipeline is an expression that is showing how the number of the percentage of women is um, uh, progressively uh, 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 increase or decreasing over time as we look at the progress from uh, the, the beginning of the studies to the highest uh, level of uh, academic field. Uh, and uh, this uh, uh, leaky pipeline is showing basically how, uh, as we can see, the, the women are dropping out from the pipeline, uh, so to speak, uh, mostly on postdoctoral or like mostly, but uh, the, the statistics are showing that uh, the number of women drop at the level of postdoctoral, at the postdoctoral level, when competition for more senior and more stable position is taking place. And this is uh, no coincidence uh, for two reasons. One is so-called bottleneck, and that is that there is a bigger number of uh, uh, students, uh, uh, even postgraduate students, than that there is a number of academic posts, uh, teaching and research positions. Uh, therefore, the competition is very high. And in this competition, gender bias is contributing uh, to uh, also why men are more often uh, chosen than women for more stable tenure track positions. But even uh, the, the research is showing that another key uh, a factor is the fact that the uh, period after finishing PhD is the period when majority of people are making uh, decisions uh, about uh, making their own families, uh, are having babies, are organizing their life about uh, taking care of other people. And uh, as uh, data are showing, women are still doing majority of caring uh, duties, uh, taking care of household, uh, children, elderly, and uh, well-being of the whole household. Uh, and this is the factor that is um, influencing why women are not uh, uh, succeeding uh, in this competition for various uh, reasons that we will discuss uh, further on. Uh, 
data and uh, uh, gender bias is part uh, of the story. I think uh, Maxim can uh, take on from here. We don't hear you, Maxim, please. Uh, in the meantime, I was uh, sharing uh, additional uh, uh, contextual element uh, to support what you, you told about, uh, you. Uh, about vertical segregation in particular. So with regard to, uh, to those gender bias, uh, they, they are not limited indeed to this horizontal or vertical segregation that we know and that as we have seen is obviously related to gender as a social construct because it, is, it varies across disciplines according to specific stereotype within each discipline uh, uh, according to stereotypes uh, uh, conveyed in relation to subfields of study uh, within each discipline and across countries, uh, which means that those stereotypes do not work the same way. But there is a general concept behind, which is the one of gender bias, and that can also be identified in relation to accessing resource uh, or accessing, for instance, international mobility, two very important aspects uh, for successful research career uh, uh, in the academia nowadays. So um, with regard to access to resources, there are, there are no such figures as the one provided, for instance, by she figures every four years at the EU level, at a very aggregated level. But every time uh, there is a, um, a pilot study carried out in one or another uh, uh, EU country or country of the European research area, with regard to uh, the access of men and women to uh, grant review processes uh, to uh, get funded for their research, uh, what we see is that there are persisting gender gaps that have been documented also in science uh, journal and in many other uh, uh, research outlet. So for instance, in this survey, which is quite old now, it's nearly uh, over eight years ago, uh, in the Netherlands with the National Funding Agency, what we see is something that has been documented widely elsewhere. Uh, the more personal the process, that is the more interpersonal and interactive, for instance, through selection panels, interviewing uh, people presenting a research project, uh, the bigger the gender gap. So there is already a gap at the beginning, which can be related to the, uh, to the pool of uh, women and men in one particular uh, area. But this uh, original gap is broadening, uh, is deepening as we move up, uh, 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 we move along this selection process, meaning that gender bias uh, are uh, involved at some point. Another interesting figures uh, here coming again from the latest issue of uh, she, she figures is in relation to accessing research mobility. What we see here, a bit like for the first slide that Giovanna presented about horizontal segregation is both, um, if we zoom out, we see the general picture. The general picture is that men and women do not have the same opportunities in accessing international research mobility that can support their further career development. In general, women, there is a gap that can uh, amount to uh, up to 10 or 11% between the uh, international mobility of female researchers and of male researchers. Uh, and if we zoom in, we see that the situation is variegated across uh, the countries of the European research area, and that there are some fewer countries where the gap is to apparently to the benefit of women. But if you look to uh, the extreme left of this graph and you see uh, that uh, uh, countries where um, um, there is this bigger gap uh, are, for instance, Slovakia or Poland or Ireland. Uh, just to um, um, encapsulate a little bit or summarize a little bit these notions, um, uh, the influence of those different bias uh, over uh, uh, careers in the academia with regard to gender um, in the notion of gender bias merit. So what we see is that there are persistent inequalities and those persistent inequalities that affect virtually all research organization across Europe means that those organizations have remained largely gendered and that they do not provide similar condition to their staff uh, based on these uh, factors. So the notion of meritocracy, which is the one upon which usually those organizations are building their management policies, at least they present so, is uh, also likely to reproduce 
uh, uh, gender bias. And this is um, quite understandable because there is a widely shared belief that you may face in your, face in your own organization that uh, uh, the way to treat people fairly is to treat them all the same. That is to uh, stick to a generic norm uh, and standard of research excellence or of academic merit. So, but the problem is that if that standard is the same for everyone, not taking into account their different position of departure, then it is not amounting to treating people fairly. Actually, it's quite discriminatory. So there is this uh, misconception that we have to deal with very often. That is that treating employees the same is not equivalent to treating them equally. And in most cases, same treatment will be quite unfair as on this cartoon. Uh, and it is also important to highlight that treating employees differently does not, is not equivalent to treating them discriminatorily because it just means that you will take into account there are different conditions of, uh, uh, there are different starting points also in relation to gender norms, the different uh, uh, burden that they can be confronted with and that you will uh, take that into account in designing um, a merit scale, uh, a merit concept uh, that uh, uh, does not place people in very uh, disadvantaged position from, uh, from the very start. And what is also telling is that those gender biases that affect the distribution of men and women uh, uh, in terms of careers and opportunities also affect the knowledge which is being produced by our organization. Why? Simply because there is first a very masculine image of science, uh, of the very uh, purpose of doing uh, science. Um, and this is related obviously to history and that's still reflected in the Google algorithm, for instance. And here I, I shitted a little bit because I made the research with uh, in Polish uh, which uh, return uh, uh, a bit more uh, female face, although it is always the one of uh, uh, Marie Skłodowska uh, Curie. Uh, so that's uh, a bit of shitting. But if you do it in another language, most likely you will have a fully male uh, gallery of portraits featuring that just reflect how uh, historically uh, the situation was. And this is uh, also related to uh, um, the invisibilization of the contribution of women to science. So it's not just that they have been long excluded from our education or academic institutions like universities and that still uh, since the middle ages, but also that when they have made strong contributions to a particular field, for instance, in STEMs, um, uh, they are often not acknowledged uh, uh, for their work. And this has been coined actually as a uh, the Matilda effect consisting in systematically uh, invisibilizing uh, the contribution of women to sciences and uh, technologies by considering that their own endeavors and contribution uh, uh, were not their own and that they had to share it with a male uh, that usually get most of the credit uh, for it. And here you have a few examples. You can find, find so many more. And ultimately we see that the knowledge and research which is being produced is usually gender blind, does not take into account neither potential sex differences nor the differences which are induced by different gendered roles and the conduct of men and women in society. And this will further fuel uh, this um, 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 uh, circulation of gender stereotypes biases and inequalities ultimately leading to research which are biased in terms of hypothesis, modeling, data selection, data labeling, uh, data analysis, uh, uh, and their potential uses. And we have many examples both from engineering or from uh, 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 from a woman, um, uh, 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 from biomedical researchers, uh, just as the couple of examples we put here you know, the different uh, degree of recognition of the symptoms for heart failure and medical and uh, um, uh, cardiovascular diseases in general, which are quite different for men and women. 
And for long, men were suffering cardiovascular diseases to a much greater extent than women. And then women started to share some social habits like drinking or smoking or professional stress with men uh, as they entered also in the paid work uh, area on the top of their unpaid uh, care duties. And this led them to uh, uh, amounting for a significant proportion of people suffering cardiovascular diseases without biomedical research adapting to their particular symptoms uh, 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 or uh, uh, characteristics, uh, which led ultimately to uh, epidemiological consequences. Women are still less at risk of suffering a heart failure than men, but they are more at risk of dying from it than men are because their symptoms are not covered or uh, uh, dealt with. And uh, uh, more recently in the area of uh, ITs and ICTs, uh, we have seen uh, emerging many, many research evidencing gender and other bias as racial bias, as the one that uh, uh, show that the main um, facilities for facial recognition that have been designed over uh, the few last years uh, are all very uh, biased in terms of uh, gender, but also race. And the intersection of both lead to the poorest uh, results, showing that intersectionality in practice uh, works in a very negative way. So if there are such, uh, uh, such um, actually biases, uh, it's because uh, they are widespread and that we uh, all uh, own them. That's not related to uh, who we are or which is our own gender actually, uh, and sex. It is very much related to the way our brain is working. And uh, they are, uh, it's uh, usually very useful at the time of, uh, uh, you know, starting your gender analysis uh, in your own context to uh, define and share uh, with stakeholders about those unconscious uh, bias, which are many. You will find in the PowerPoint that you will receive afterwards Further example from the IT sector, but here I would like first to go to the definition because we are slightly late uh, on time. Um, so unconscious bias, uh, that the common definition which is often given, occurs when we make judgments or decisions on the basis of our prior experience, our own personal deep-seated thought patterns, assumptions or interpretations, and we are not aware at all that we are doing it. And uh, now, if I'm correct, I will be the one to take you quickly through a recent development uh, uh, at European and national levels in terms of promoting gender equality in research for two reasons. First, because those policies are based on the status quo and a common understanding of the status quo that we just described. So this is a baseline of it. Those policies basically exist because they acknowledge the situation of segregation, both vertical and horizontal, and of gender bias in research that we just described, but also because those policies are moving fast, ultimately, and they are providing a global context for reshaping the understanding of what scientific excellence and academic merit are, which is very relevant to our point today. So it's important to have this broader view. So as you know, the EU policies are not new in this field. They can be uh, tracked back to uh, 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 the late 1990s, 1999. They celebrated their 20 years last year. So they entered in their, into their third decade. And if we just make a quick distinction, there were basically two phases in those EU policies for gendering research. A first phase is during which it was all about fixing the woman. So because the institution in scientific production was, uh, 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 um, um, you know, had a pattern which was very androcentric and male-centered, the purpose of those policies was basically to adapt women to this dominant norm by coaching them, training them, mentoring them, for instance. But we quickly realized that it did not change much the picture or not fast enough simply because you had to put virtually one mentor or one trainer be behind each potential, uh, each woman potentially wanting to access further step 
in your career and it doesn't work that way. So the second phases that came from the mid 2000 was about changing institution so that they would ensure gender equality in scientific careers, gender balance in decision-making and also integrating the gender dimension into the content of research because bias and their result in terms of segregation are very much connected as we have seen. So now the policy, the EU policy is basically responding to the who, what and how question. Who, it's about equal opportunities of men and women in research. It's about fixing figures. What and how, it's about integrating the gender dimension in research content. And it has been working that way for the last few years. What is more important and what I would like to highlight here, which is relevant to our um, subject of the day, is that there are recent trends in gendering the European research areas that is also beyond Europe toward, uh, 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 toward uh, other countries. Uh, and these trends are the greater focus placed on STEMs and ICTs. The focus placed on what are called in uh, the European jargon, the lower research intensive countries or the widening countries, mostly located in Central Eastern Europe, but also in Southern Europe, those who benefit less from EU funding for research with the idea to bridge at the same time, the, the innovation gap in terms of access to EU funding for research and the gender gap and making the two part of the same picture. Another very important development is that as from 2021, although, although with progressive steps, adopting and implementing a gender equality plan will become an eligibility criteria for accessing EU research funding, which is a game changer, as you can imagine, because uh, it will be no longer possible after a few years to access such funding without proper gender equality strategy. And recently as well, the European Commission decided back in November last month to support research on intersecting inequalities also through EU research funding, opening new ways uh, to, to explore those ideas. And to support institutions in doing so, uh, there are tools that are, are being updated and tools that will be created. The uh, one that, sorry, one that you may know, which is uh, gender uh, equality in academia and research tool called GEAR, available from the European Institute for Gender Equality uh, that has been updated content-wise uh, over the months of September and will be uh, uh, made more user-friendly as from next year. And a new European support facility for institutions implementing gender equality plans so as to provide them not only with tools, good practices, but also with help desk support, knowledge transfer in form of training and so on and so on. And by the way, uh, Gender Equality uh, Academy is part of this uh, recent picture of this recent evolution because it is meant to provide new standards for gender equality training and making a broader offer valuable. Uh, so uh, now we will, uh, uh, Maxime has uh, nicely pointed out that European strategies uh, of um, uh, helping uh, or supporting gender equality were initially uh, dealing with how to fix women uh, and uh, have come to the point where we realize we have to fix the organizations. Uh, basically, we need changes within the institutions. Therefore, it is important to be on board that, that everybody understand uh, when we say institutional change, what we mean by that. It is strategical change, not just the change that happens due to changes in academia and economy, but strategically aimed um, uh, change that is initiated within uh, the institution itself and is tackling how the work is organized and how it is, the practices of working uh, are um, uh, being executed within the institution. And uh, therefore institutional change would be um, uh, involving um, the detecting obstacles to gender equality and then thinking strategically how to tackle them and to change them. Therefore, um, 
there are different areas of actions that are usually subject of institutional change and not but not every institutional change is including all of the aspects that we will be presenting this basically uh, depends on what is the starting point within the organizations in all these areas so the organizational culture meaning how institution uh, is uh, uh, organizing uh, everyday uh, work, One, what is the usual form uh, of the meetings and decision makings, all these uh, subtle um, uh, things uh, that are not uh, just uh, uh, part of legislation, but the whole culture that is uh, determining how the institution is working. Uh, this is also including reconciliation of work and private life. Uh, institutions have uh, many um, possibilities to go way beyond the legislation, uh, uh, way beyond the, what legislation, uh, um, you know, decides as eight hours working hour and a certain type of uh, uh, pattern uh, of uh, parent leave or leave for taking uh, care of your children. So uh, how the institution is reconciling the two is uh, usually uh, a big part of institutional change. Then um, all um, uh, practices and uh, norms uh, of uh, that are determining how recruitment of academic staff, their selection and their career progress is uh, taking place. Uh, this is usually something that is very uh, gendered in practice, but very neutral on paper. So this is what, what uh, where institutions can do a lot. Then leadership and decision making, uh, for instance, uh, whether institution is taking care that uh, decision that, that uh, decision making bodies are gender balanced, and that uh, 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 women are encouraged to take leadership roles. Uh, then uh, how institution is tackling sexual and gender based harassment is usually big. Uh, area of action. And my experience from uh, Central and Eastern European countries is that very often there is no clear policy or um, uh, or body or office or person that is in charge of taking care uh, when such uh, occurrences happen and that there is no knowledge that such things as harassment are taking place within the institution. So sometimes um, Institutional change means also starting from a scratch, inventing something that there was not uh, there before. And uh, uh, in institutional change may encompass also integration of gender perspective in research, in teaching. So change of the curriculum is uh, very often part of institutional change, uh, especially if it's uh, one, that is uh, intentionally thinking how to make the subject matter of um, the academic research more gender sensitive. Uh, then um, in order for institutional change to really function in practice, uh, it is important uh, to, uh, for institutional change to be participatory. This means that uh, it's not uh, top down, but it's uh, involving um, institutional change should be involving as many stakeholders within the institution uh, as, uh, uh, as, as needed. Uh, uh, so it should be holistic to include uh, people uh, uh, from all segments of institutional working. So if institutional change is only uh, uh, decided and uh, uh, by academics, and it's not really involving uh, the aspect of uh, necessary administrative change, then those who are supposed to implement it uh, are not going uh, to either understand what they are supposed to do, or they are, will not be committed, and uh, the change will not be really uh, long-term and effective. So institutional change needs to be inclusive, and here very often, academics need to put down their uh, hat of authority uh, or step down from uh, the uh, 
uh, prestigious uh, position and ask administrative staff of their opinion, which is not uh, usually a uh, case. Uh, then um, uh, institutional change needs to be visible, meaning that it's not enough that only um, academic managers uh, decide upon, um, you know, um, making um, uh, certain changes in the working of the organization in order to enable better work-life balance. It is key important that all employees know that these new provisions are there, are available, and that they can use it. So. Um, any kind of change needs to be announced uh, and, uh, uh, and promoted among the staff. Uh, then institutional change needs to be flexible because sometimes, especially in the area of work-life balance, what, what uh, managers might think is needed is not really uh, suiting uh, those who are supposed to benefit from these institutional changes. So flexibility and change uh, along the way so um, uh, a certain plan should never be carved in stone, but should be uh, accommodated uh, and should be changing as uh, we are realizing what are the effects of uh, these particular uh, new provisions. Uh, and the crucial one, um, institutional change needs to be sustainable. Uh, so uh, if you uh, organize a one-time event promoting women in science, probably in two years' time this is not going to make a, a big effect in itself. If you make something a part of uh, uh, of the basic institutional uh, 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 norms and a part of uh, 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 statuses and operations, uh, then the change uh, has, uh, uh, there is possibility that, uh, that something will uh, uh, sustain over time. Uh, very often institutional changes are happening as part of European projects uh, or uh, as part of, you know, meeting uh, new Horizon 2020 criteria. Uh, but in order really, uh, uh, we, we should always think how to make them sustainable and not one-time uh, uh, event. Uh, yeah. yes, sorry. No, no, no. Yes, yeah. thank you, Giovanna. If, if I may just uh, add upon this, I, I shared uh, also through, through the chat. Uh, uh, th these principles are really, are really important. They have actually been built uh, from experience uh, uh, based on many uh, um, experiences in driving institutional change in the academia. Uh, and um, I would like also to add that uh, the holistic aspect is also referring um, upon uh, on the top of what Giovanna uh, already said to the fact that it's better to cover uh, all areas of actions or several areas of actions rather than to focus on just a couple of ones. So evidently it should be based on your own status quo, on your own audit of the situation. Uh, so you might not address every area of action that we have mentioned to the same extent based on your context, on your window of opportunity, also on the resistances and challenges you may face, but it is important to cover different uh, of them uh, at once. Uh, uh, because uh, structural change or institutional change rarely take place with just uh, one single focus uh, uh, of action. And in terms of uh, vi visibility, what, uh, what uh, Giovanna mentioned, um, on the top of uh, making the change process visible, at some point you need the changes to take place <laughs> because they are not only promised and think something that uh, is uh, definitely out of reach. It has to uh, change in the institution. So things may take a lot of time to change, like figures, you know, segregation, horizontal and vertical segregation, but other may not take so much time, like the communication, the visual uh, of, of the organization, uh, the process uh, in uh, reviewing um, um, uh, research project, uh, the way to, uh, to define a curriculum, to integrate a gender perspective. This may take a bit of time, but not so much. And this will participate to the change process as well. And in terms of flexibility, obviously the COVID-19 situation is showing how much flexibility is needed 
Uh, so change, if something doesn't work, change it. If some things need to be readapted in terms of action, it has also to be, to be changed. So from now on, from uh, on these good principles, uh, uh, all those principles are to be implemented. Well, they are to be implemented most of the, in most of the cases through gender equality strategies or plans. So the, the, the JEPs, the so-called JEPs, gender equality plans, that many of you are already putting together or implementing or forecasting, uh, they are simply a tool to make this institutional process of change uh, to take place. And therefore, they have been also defined, uh, notably at the level of the European Commission, as a set of actions which are aimed at conducting audits uh, of procedures, of practices, because they are those to be changed, so as to identify where gender bias can take place uh, with view to correct them, to identify and implement innovative strategies to correct uh, and control those bias, uh, uh, as those that we have earlier discussed, and setting targets and monitoring progress through indicators. So not only uh, knowing the situation, not only acting upon the situation in a structured way and comprehensive and if possible, holistic way, but also setting targets and monitoring whether you are achieving those targets uh, or not. And for this reason, uh, a gender equality plan cannot be the mere adoption of generic objectives to foster gender equality. We see in many institutions general commitment toward gender equality. We want to be a gender aware or gender sensitive organization and we will make sure to be it, period. That is not a gender equality strategy or plan. You need to, uh, sorry, you need to uh, uh, unfold these objectives in specific actions with people in charge of those actions, people or department or unit or mechanism uh, and with some monitoring instruments so that uh, you, uh, there is accountability towards those generic objectives. Generally, it is now um, acknowledged that there are at least six steps in uh, uh, a gender equality plan process to deliver change. The first step is to get started. It is basically to know uh, uh, with whom you should work, who is in charge of what in the organization uh, 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 to get the basic knowledge uh, available so that you can uh, uh, foresee um, uh, your, um, how you will set up your strategy. It is analyzing and assessing the state of the place through gender audits, through gathering data, through building and uh, uh, building data which is not available yet that also might be needed. And that takes a lot of time, as you probably already know. Then it is setting up, designing your gender equality plan, ideally in a participatory way, so that it is not something imposed uh, from top uh, down, but something that involves different people in the institution, uh, and so that they can bring their own knowledge and views and align a little bit in terms of understanding of the uh, situation of departure. Then you have to implement it obviously, and uh, as effectively as possible, also through change facilitation and involving people, and to monitor progress and make regular evaluation of how does it work, how far does it deliver the promised change. The sixth step is important as well, uh, because often, as Giovanna pointed out, a gender equality plan or strategy or process of institutional change as a whole is bound to, uh, uh, to um, a certain timing, the one of a project, the one of a determined strategy, the one of a mission statement implementation, and you need to think further so that it will be sustainable. So what will come later on? What will be the next step? Will it be any further plan or strategy? Uh, 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 what will come actually uh, after? And with regard to sustainability that Giovanna pointed uh, out as well, which is a very key point, sustainability usually goes also with institutionalization. So if you develop practices, if you develop actions 
which are not incorporated into the way of working on a daily basis, into the routine of your organization, the changes might not be sustainable. They might not even produce the desired effect uh, because it has to be fully connected to the way your organization works. What we often see is the institutional change process for gender equality going on separate tracks with regard to all their process of change, digitalization, internationalization, competitiveness uh, of the organization. So usually there is a big agenda that uh, your stakeholders are fully aware of, which is unfolding on its own rhythm and schedule. And the institutional change for gender equality, if taking place at all, is usually taking a different path. That is problematic because it has to be connected as much as possible to the core agenda of your organization. First, to be on the same level of importance and treated as such by your key stakeholders and top leadership, but also to make sure that any window of opportunities that will open in those other process of changes, which are likely to take place at the same time, will be used for mainstreaming gender into it and not being lost for the cause, if I may put it that way. So that uh, are very uh, important, um, uh, important points. Generally speaking, there are like three aspects which are less covered. Organizational culture, so getting further than recruitment processes and work-life balance and so on, but uh, uh, like the broader picture. Second is integration of gender perspective in research. So disconnecting the uh, human resource aspect from the knowledge production aspect. And the last one is uh, gender-based harassment, which is, seems to be less covered. So this um, is consistent with what you see, generally speaking, in a youth-funded project aimed at implementing change. These are the three aspects which are usually less addressed. And this might be problematic because if you have an institution where the broad organizational culture is completely androcentric, male-centered, does not allow for more diversity. If it does not uh, address properly potential cases of gender-based harassment or ordinary sexism, and if it does not connect the issue of uh, gendering the organization with gendering knowledge production, you might not have the full picture first, nor the backup, logical backup to articulate these different areas. So um, I think it's relevant to point this out.